Science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, a crucial component of Idaho's economy. But thousands of STEM jobs are going unfilled, meaning hundreds of millions of dollars in lost wages and tens of millions of dollars in lost state tax revenue. Idaho STEM Action Center Executive Director Angela Hemingway discusses the root causes of the problem and how the state can grow the workforce needed to fill these high-paying jobs. Plus, impeachment perception. How are the proceedings against President Trump being perceived by America's friends and foes across borders and overseas? Boise State foreign relations expert Stephen Feldstein on the geopolitical ramifications of putting the president on trial. Ahead on Viewpoint. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. Jobs in science, technology, engineering, and math are definitely the jobs of the future. They're also the jobs of right now. And right now, Idaho doesn't have enough workers with the STEM skills to fill those positions. And that's an expensive problem. When Idaho STEM Action Center Executive Director, uh, Dr. Angela Hemingway gave her budget presentation to the legislature's budget setting committee, JFAC, the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee, she laid out the STEM challenges Idaho faces. In 2019, there were 7,633 unfilled STEM jobs. That's up from 3,813 in 2016. Hemingway said that those 7,600 unfilled jobs equates to $516 million in lost personal wages and $27 million in lost state tax receipts. Now, there are currently 86,000 STEM workers statewide, and the Idaho Department of Labor predicts there will be 105,000 STEM jobs by 2026, just six years from now. My guest today is Idaho STEM Action Center Executive Director, Dr. Angela Hemingway. Angela, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, just in brief, what is the Idaho STEM Action Center? So the Idaho STEM Action Center was created really as business, industry, uh, legislators, government recognized that we had this pipeline that was continuing to be unfilled with, with the STEM workforce. And so we were created to really focus on access for educators, alignment of education to industry, and then awareness of the opportunities that exist in STEM right here in Idaho. And you're part of the governor's office, right? That is correct, yes. Um, I wanna uh, talk a little bit more about what you do um, in a little bit, but first let's talk about the situation that you presented um, to JFAC. And I wanna show the numbers again that I just talked about here on the screen. Um, what kind of impact does a shortage like this have on the state of Idaho? And terms of money and um, jobs. Certainly, as you alluded to, personal uh, income was certainly down by half a billion dollars, which is concerning. Tax revenues were down $27 million. So it does indicate that there is a really urgent need to create a workforce that can fill these STEM jobs. And in fact, just last year, STEM jobs grew at a very robust rate of 4.4% compared to 2.8% for non-STEM jobs. Hmm. So STEM jobs are growing very rapidly. We are also seeing more and more students, though, being interested uh, in STEM jobs and going into STEM jobs. In fact, over uh, two school years, we've seen students in post-secondary education taking STEM courses increase by 2.3%. Not quite matching our 4.4% STEM job growth rate, but definitely kind of helping uh, keep that pipeline full of our future workforce. So, uh, you know, we showed that it was, you know, 3,600 in 2016 and 7,600 or so here in 2019. Why are there so many unfilled STEM jobs in Idaho? Well, our economy continues to boom. Our tech sector continues to grow. The number of startups coming to Idaho or, or being uh, hatched in Idaho really is also increasing. So it just, this is a place where people want to live and they want to start uh, business. And so we've got to make sure that we have a workforce coming through that pipeline that's poised and ready to take those jobs that are here today. Did, did education have anything to do with it in terms of putting enough students into that pipeline in the past? Well, I think what we've been really focused on is ensuring that our educators do have training and resources to be able to deliver STEM education to students in their communities. So for example, over the past two completed school years, because of our work and collaborations with others, we've seen an 11% increase in the number of secondary teachers teaching computer science courses. So that's teachers in grades six through 12 that are now able to deliver instruction to their students. 11% is phenomenal. 
and students are really eager to participate in these courses. We've seen an 18% increase in the number of students actually taking computer science courses in the past two years. So that illustrates that having a trained educator uh, will allow these students access to these opportunities, which will therefore kind of increase that mm -hmm. um, availability in the pipeline. So the education is catching up also with the need for the, the how fast it's growing. The, the education, the training, and the resources mm -hmm. is definitely catching up with the need. Are you concerned at all that the growth is still going to outpace the number of, as you put it, um, people in the pipeline to do these jobs? Uh, well, I think we need to be laser focused on continuing to provide access and training to, to educators so that they can deliver uh, STEM education to their students. So mm -hmm. it definitely, as you, as you alluded to, we expect 19,000 new STEM jobs in just six years, uh, yeah. which is a, a huge number. And that doesn't include the number of individuals that will retire and perhaps will leave our state. So we continue to have this really robust STEM opportunity. Is, it, um, is the STEM growth <coughs> nationwide or is it something that, that Idaho is seeing maybe on a higher percentage than some other states in terms of the job growth, the potential. You're exactly right. The, the job growth nationwide is, is significant as uh, more and more jobs are becoming available. So, for example, <clears throat> I think there's been a misconception over the years that STEM jobs are just four-year degree, you know, jobs uh, that go through college. And that, that is a myth that we absolutely need to break down. There's a variety of pathways that students can take into a high demand, high pay uh, STEM profession. Mm -hmm. So for example, they all require that students get a diploma or a GED, that's step one. But then students may choose to go into an apprenticeship pathway and become an electrician or a carpenter or a plumber. They may choose to go the military route, gaining experience through the military. Perhaps they, they get a technician certificate. So so certified nursing assistants, surgical techs, pharmacy techs, really high demand jobs. And then obviously some will go on and get four year degrees and beyond. Mm -hmm. So the diversity of STEM jobs is really significant. We need to provide students information about the pathways uh, that they can access those jobs. Do you find that people think maybe it's, it's engineers and you know, doctoral candidates and, and um, computer yeah. programmers only? You're exactly right, and I think that's why we've got to break this myth down and, and let students, uh, parents, know that there are a variety of opportunities out there for their students. And in fact, just today, I was looking at IdahoWorks.gov, and right now in Idaho today, there are 27,000 job openings. So we have jobs here in Idaho, and if students and parents are wondering uh, what job or career might be appropriate for, for them or their child, they Look can where go, the need is. Huh? And where the need is, they can actually go to a website called Next steps and there's this awesome assessment called Future Finder where students can sit down and they take this short assessment about their skills and their interests and it might help guide them in some of their career choices as they're transitioning out of high school into the workforce. So what role does the Idaho STEM Action Center play in um, solving this issue? We are this critical bridge between education and workforce. So we want to provide a variety of opportunities for educators to engage with businesses and industries in their local communities. So for example, we currently have an, an opportunity that's open called a teacher externship. Uh, what we do is we place a teacher into a local business to gain skills about today's workforce. There are many, many teachers in Idaho like me. I went to high school and then I went to college to become a teacher and then I started teaching. So my understanding of the work that goes, in on, goes on in the private sector is incredibly limited. So by allowing teachers to go into a workforce and realize that Micron isn't just about engineers, there's also quality control, there's technicians, there's a whole side of HR and cybersecurity, really opening their perspective about the opportunities so they can then work with their students to recognize that, that the jobs that um, we maybe perceive exist are actually much more, more broad than, than what we know. So that external program is phenomenal. And you also do grants and like outreach uh, programs, like competitions for students and things like that, right? We do. We have some uh, phenomenal opportunities. We're getting ready to uh, launch a professional development called iSTEM. We have 37 master educators in Idaho that are going to deliver a variety of different training throughout our state to over 500 Idaho educators. We're talking drones and 3D printing, uh, virtual reality, coding um, for all ages, kindergarten through grade 12, mm -hmm. and really focused on partnerships that can be made within the community 
in school, out of school, libraries, businesses, building these community networks to really support STEM education. We also have some really fun competitions coming up. Uh, would love to invite you out to First Robotics. That's occurring March 27th and 28th. Kids are focused on a Star Wars theme this year, and they have to create robots that can actually see color, spin dials, throw balls. They have to be able to hook onto a, a, a rocket ship that's about six <laughs> feet in the air and pull themselves up for the launch. And it is gonna be a phenomenal activity. Science and engineering fair is going on for students. So there are a variety of opportunities for businesses to get involved with our programs. So you are very much hand in hand with business. You have a lot of business sponsors, sponsors as well, right? Or partners. We have uh, businesses that are giving us time, talent, and treasure. Mm -hmm. uh, so absolutely, uh, we want to provide a, a, a variety of pathways for which businesses can engage with, with education. And I understand that there is a, a, a recommendation to increase your budget, your state budget, um, for your department this year, correct? Yes, thank you very much. A recommendation? Yes, a recommendation. Or you're asking for more? Well, it, it is a, an opportunity for us to continue to partner with business, raise funds, and then have some, uh, some our, our state appropriation from the general fund that will help support a variety of opportunities. So for example, a business or industry might want to support a training, and that training could be very specific to that business. So for example, Chobani might want to do a food science training in Twin Falls. Mm -hmm. We're able to use uh, state funding to make sure educators from our rural communities can be part of that training as well. So it allows us to really okay. enhance and expand opportunities. But you also do a lot of fundraising then? We do. Okay. We, we partner with businesses to, uh, to bring forth funds into programs. Real quick, we just have like 10 seconds left. How can my viewers be involved or what can they do to help the STEM future? stem.idaho.gov forward slash volunteer would be a place they can go if they want to engage in some of our volunteer opportunities and they can reach out to, to me at the STEM Action Center for some potential partnership opportunities as oh. well. Dr. Angela Hamelman, thank you so much thank for your you. time. Thank you, appreciate um, and as you. As she said, if you want more information, go to that website and uh, check it out. Well, still ahead this morning, the impeachment of President Trump. The hearings and trial have been all over television in the United States, but how closely are our allies and enemies watching what's going on and does it make a difference in how they deal with the U.S.? We'll dive into that next. You could actually win the show this year. Champions Monday. Need glasses now? We have a lens lab in every store and can make them for you in as little as 30 minutes. Two pairs start at just $38.71, and 91% of our glasses are ready the same day. No one makes glasses faster than iMart Express. The entire idea of this program is to empower kids. He donates a lot of his time to helping us. It's more than just chess, he's giving kids the skills they need to accomplish their dreams. An all new 7 0 tonight on the News at 10. The President's Day Super Sale at Furniture Row is on now, and you don't want to miss it. Shop today and find amazing deals storewide on dining, living, bedroom, and mattresses. And best of all, the more you buy, the more you save. Save 100 bucks on every thousand you spend. Or score a free patio set when you spend $29.99 or more. Plus, seven years no interest financing. The President's Day Super Sale, only at Furniture Row. Boise voters poured cold water on a stadium proposal last fall. But in certain circles, it's still a hot topic. What are the possibilities in the next few years that a multi-purpose stadium ends up in Meridian or Garden City, taking the Boise Hawks, professional soccer, and big tax revenues with it? I asked the Boise mayor where the city stands now. We'll break it down for sports fans all over Southern Idaho. Switch over after the game tonight at 10 on Idaho's News Channel 7.
Welcome back to Viewpoint. The impeachment of President Trump has been playing out for months now. First the impeachment inquiry, then the vote to impeach, and then the trial. Now this Viewpoint was taped on Thursday, so we realize major developments likely happened in the trial. So we're focusing on how the impeachment is perceived in other countries. What does it mean for America's prestige and reputation among our friends and foes? Stephen Feldstein is the Frank and Bethine Church Chair of Public Affairs for the Frank Church Institute at Boise State University. He also served as U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration. And before that, he was a counsel on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The Frank Church Institute is a nonpartisan organization established to promote discussion and thought on key public affairs and foreign relations issues. Steve, thanks a lot for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, hey, let's just jump into it with okay. the, uh, the big question this morning is, how do the friends and the foes of the U.S. perceive these impeachment proceedings against President Trump? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I actually think there's sort of three aspects that are worth considering when it comes to what people, uh, leaders abroad, are, are looking at. I think, number one, they're getting a real peek behind the curtain in terms of how policy works, particularly with regard to this president. You know, what are, who are the key decision makers? How does the president actually decide uh, who to take phone calls from, and how are some of the, what are the key issues that matter when it comes to this president? So I think that's one. Uh, I think second of all, I think there's a sense, especially if, if we end up with acquittal, which looks likely, uh, that you can get away with it, that, that there is a real benefit uh, to working with and meeting some of the demands that the president makes when it comes to tying in personal and national uh, security interests, and I think that's an important aspect. But I think three, there also is, because there is an impeachment trial and there's been such a political hullabaloo about all these issues, that there is a cost as well, that nothing comes completely free when it comes to these kind of uh, transactions taking place. And so I think they're watching all three of these aspects and how they play out with regard uh, to the proceeding. With that number three thing, you mean that there is a check and a balance in place in our government? That's right, that even if the impeachment uh, trial leads to an acquittal, the fact that there was uh, a tr uh, impeachment that occurred, that there was a, a, a big amount of, of issues when it came to the Democrats raising uh, serious charges. Uh, these are things, it means that you can't just go ahead, that there is a check and balance that does occur, especially with regard to the Congress. Do you think that um, throughout the impeachment process that's been um, months now that it's affected the enactment, implementation of, of U.S. foreign policy with those foreign leaders? I think it's hard to say, yes and no. I mean, on the one hand, there have been issues that have gone forward, uh, like USMCA that, you know. Uh, the have, mexico Canada trade agreement. That's yeah. that, exactly, uh, that have been accomplished. So on, on the one hand, business does continue to occur. On the other hand, there's without a doubt, it's been a distraction. Uh, without a doubt, it has caused the U.S. to lose focus in some of its larger uh, priorities uh, when it comes to exerting U.S. influence in the world as the large amount of the inner circle of the president is focused internally on impeachment. And that means that we're not keeping our eye on the ball on some of the big issues that matter. For and the, the United same could be said for Congress, too. That's right, sure. I mean, there's a big oversight responsibility, a big representational responsibility. And when everyone is focused internally on these proceedings month after month, it means you're not doing other things. There's an opportunity cost when it comes to this kind of trial proceeding for such a long period of time. Is there also a prestige or reputation cost when these foreign countries, maybe you know, allies or um, enemies, see our leader being put through a trial and it, it looks particularly to be partisan? Mm -hmm. I think there is a very uh, there is a long term cost in general in terms of this, and I think you know not only is it sort of showcasing the sort of dirtier underside of how policy happens with regard to this president, but I think showcasing the very large questions that have resulted from the president's conduct when it comes to conflating personal uh, and and uh, you know the public interest. I think these are things that lots of leaders look at and say, you know, what are the values that underlie the Constitution, that underlie the country? I think it raises large questions about kind of where the U.S. sits on some of these fundamental issues. And does it weaken Congress um, in eyes of outside the country? I mean, it may. I think it's uh, confusing oftentimes to understand how a bicameral legislature works That's and the true. fact that you have, you know, a House of Representatives on the one hand saying one thing and a Senate that may say another thing. So maybe there's more just confusion than anything else in terms of understanding what exactly is the role of Congress when it comes to the okay. president. Yeah. They're waiting to see what happens. Right, exactly. As well. Now, it's kind of interesting, too, that while all of this impeachment process has been going along, that things still have been getting accomplished. Um, in American government and 
sometimes in a very bipartisan way. You mentioned USMCA, the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement over trade. I think it was 89 to 10 in the Senate that voted for it. The president just signed it this past week. The, the wheels are still moving, even working together while fighting so hard in the impeachment process. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the positive things is that you still have a very large bureaucracy and a lot of dedicated public servants who want to accomplish things in the U.S. national interest. So even when you have at the top level an impeachment proceeding that seems to suck a lot of the oxygen out of Washington, D.C. when it comes to uh, the president and his conduct, uh, you still have many other things that are happening that need to happen, whether it's within our embassies, whether it's on our, more, our broader foreign policy agenda uh, that occur. Uh, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, there's no question that this has been a major distraction in terms of our top level engagement on the issues that matter for the United States, without a question. Let's talk about some other things um, while we have you here. Um, the uh, Iran news was all over the place um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, President Trump decided to, uh, you know, to bomb the very powerful Iranian uh, General Qasem Soleimani. Iran struck back, sending some missiles into bases where U.S. forces were housed in Iraq. Um, and then, of course, Iran admitted to mistaking the Ukrainian jet uh, for a missile and shot it down. There was so much going on, so much tension, and now it seems so quiet. Mm -hmm. Is that really the way it is? Yeah, I would say no. I mean, partially this is the, the, you know, the sort of our attention has focused so much on impeachment once again that we're not looking at these issues. But, you know, even if there is a lull, which there is for a moment, uh, it's only short term. I mean, have the fundamental aspects that have caused tension changed in terms of Iran's drive towards uh, a renewed drive towards a nuclear ambition, uh, when it comes to instability in Iraq, when it comes to different forces, Hezbollah, other forces uh, mm -hmm. bankrolled by Iran throughout the region that cause instability. All those pieces are still in place. And what that means is that they're going to renew again uh, and cause uh, greater amounts of concern uh, in the coming weeks and months. Do you think that the decision to take out uh, Soleimani uh, by President Trump was, you know, ultimately um, a good thing in terms of getting Iran to back off some of the aggressive things it had been doing because maybe it, they said, whoa, that, we didn't see that one coming. And they maybe they don't know what to expect from this administration. You know, I, I tend to disagree with that. I mean, obviously, he's implicated in a lot of bad things, and so we should all recognize that fact. But there wasn't a strategy behind it. It looked very rushed. Uh, they end up having reprisal missile attacks that actually have led to more injuries than were initially disclosed by sure. the administration. So, you know, it, to me, it seems like a muddle. What was the ultimate message? You know, did it stop uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions, which is really the big test? Not really. You know, are we at a better place strategically when it comes to bossing Iran now than we were, you know, prior to the Soleimani assassination? Not really. So, you know, what is the end accomplishment beyond a short tactical victory? Hard to say. Another big issue right now, we're seeing the, uh, you know, it's a worldwide scare with the coronavirus. How do you view that in terms of a foreign relations issue? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, it's, it's an issue where, on the one hand, there continues to be a lot of tensions in the U.S.-China relationship. On the other hand, the only way to tackle this kind of pandemic or growing pandemic uh, is to actually have international cooperation. So you have a little bit, you're, we're a little bit at odds on that issue. But, you know, I've been thinking about one thing when it comes to China, and I've been thinking about its response. And what's interesting is that China, obviously, is an authoritarian country. It, it closes down and restricts information. And now it's, it's putting in place an unprecedented cordon of millions of people to say, basically, you can't get out of this quarantine zone. You know, does that actually work? Does a country that sort of uses those kind of, those kind of rules and coercion to tell people this is the way you need to behave, does that actually generate uh, a, a backlash where people try to get around those rules rather than actually trying to accede to health protocols to stop the pandemic? I think that's a good question to ask ourselves when it comes to authoritarian countries properly addressing things like pandemics. All right. Steve, take a time out right here for a minute. And uh, when we come back, we're going to wrap up Viewpoint next with Steve Feldstein's one big issue he thinks we all should be watching very closely because we're being watched very closely. Our journey begins in the majestic falls of liquid cold, brewed fresh and blended with cream over striking ice formations. Scratch that, man. Just sip and chill with a refreshingly cool any size iced coffee for $1.50. And try some of our tasty flavors or get refreshed with any of these tasty drinks. Got you a custom jersey. Thanks, man. Wait, it reads colon instead of colon. Ooh. You missed the accent. 
I know how you feel. I was missing my favorite games, but then I switched to DirecTV, and they also gave me this season of NBA League Pass. Now I can watch the NBA whenever and wherever I want. Hey, maybe next time, invite your half-brother. Send me Coleman. <laughs> TV without NBA League Pass is just kind of TV. Switch and DirecTV will give you this season of NBA League Pass, plus a $100 reward card. Call 1-800-DIRECTV. Weather is science, and science is awesome. That's why we're visiting schools all across the Treasure Valley to share the wonder of weather with bright young minds. You guys are the smartest bunch. Because the future of this science is in their hands. Okay, let's get the next group of fun. And what better way to learn than by having fun? Today we're doing the news. Can you imagine? You could actually win the show this year. The bar on fire. Got Talent Champions Monday. Somebody is systematically attacking the passengers. It's not just about the airplane anymore. They're hunting us. Mom, what the? Grace? And we're back with Boise State Chair of Public Affairs and expert on foreign relations, Stephen Feldstein. So, Steve, all right, what do you think is the one big issue we need to watch closely in 2020? Right. Well, the issue I'm really focused on, something I'm actually writing a book at the moment, looks at the inter intersection of tech and politics. And so what I think about is everything from election manipulation uh, when it comes to foreign interference or social media disinformation spreading, but also things like surveillance and facial recognition, you know, in terms of you know, who guards your privacy uh, and what capabilities do governments around the world have in terms of intruding on the very basic elements of how you live your lives. As you've been researching this, then what have you been finding that the average person needs to think about in terms of privacy and, mm -hmm. and, and those issues. Well, it's pretty hard to escape all the different ways and tools that governments now have to surveil all your movements. You know, just looking at your smartphone alone and the surveillance and location tracking that's inherent in that, but you look at everything from, you know, public space, facial recognition cameras, algorithms that power those, uh, other different aspects that are constantly, uh, is, you know, tracking what people do. It's really all around. It's very prevalent, and I don't think the safeguards exist right now for citizens to push back and say, enough is enough. My privacy is something that's important and ought to be, that ought to be safeguarded. And we've got just the electronic devices in our homes, in our hands, and everything. And um, London has become kind of well known as being, having cameras everywhere. Mm -hmm. The United mm -hmm. States has its fair share, but do you ever see us being that covered? We're not that covered yet, but it's also surprising the different ways law enforcement can use different services these days to actually match facial recognition to individuals. And a lot of these stories are sort of breaking uh, mm -hmm. by the day in terms of these capabilities. It's really eerie. So how long do you think it'll be until the book is out? Um, the book is due in May. It will come out either end of this year or early next year. All right. It's going to be fascinating to check it out. Certainly something that affects all of us, oh, no doubt you. about it. And the privacy is such a huge thing right okay. now. Steve Feldstein, thank you so much for your time today. I always appreciate your, your knowledge and expertise on these issues. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be on. And we'll do it again soon. You got it. All right. Well, that is all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching this morning. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tomorrow on today's Morning News and then right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint.